something beside me A light to the kerosene And the places aren't real anymore And the faces don't say anything This episode of Devil's Chess Club is available to everyone, courtesy of Four Died Trying, the new documentary film series which explores the extraordinary lives and cataclysmic assassinations of JFK, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and Robert F. Kennedy. The Patreon page for the Four Died Trying documentary series is launching, uh, it has already launched actually. It offers patrons earliest access to new films and a number of other perks, now including access to the newest film, Chapter One, The World As It Was. Please support us by subscribing to the American Exception podcast on Patreon. You will get access to many episodes of the American Exception podcast, including the Peter Darrell Scott oral history series with new episodes this month. Peter is a peerless poet, scholar, and chronicler of the deep state. We've been discussing his lesser known but very important poem and article about the forgotten Russian 9-11, as well as its connections to the American 9-11 and to so much more. This is fascinating material coming from a true iconoclast. I urge everyone to listen to these by subscribing to the American Exception podcast on Patreon. Coming up in just a moment, Bryce Green and I are joined again by our third co-host, the journalist and historian David Talbot. After that, Jeffrey Kay returns to the show to talk about his new investigation and article, Suppressed for Decades, FBI Reports Suggest Japanese World War II Balloon Attacks on U.S. and Canada Included Biological Agents. Jeffrey Kay is a psychologist turned blogger and forensic historian. He's also the author of Cover Up at Guantanamo and a number of Korean War bio-warfare articles. Check the show notes for links to the items we'll be discussing today. Bryce Green, great to be back with you. It's good to be back, Aaron. And David Talbot, always a pleasure to have you here. Yes, good to be here. So we are in the middle of a a long presidential campaign season with many events in the world that are going on that are crazy. And a lot of American U.S. history of this empire, I think people are looking at it now in different ways. They're looking at the the history of Israel. There are actually more people are looking at like Zionism as a as a separate political thing that they should actually try to understand. There's many things that people are examining now, I think, because things are going so badly and uh, David, something you've written about, Bryce, I know you're interested in this subject. I wrote a whole dissertation on it, uh, and it's the American deep state. What is the deep state? And mainstream coverage is always really bad on this, and uh, I, this newest is is no exception. So I wanted to show you guys this. I'm not going to show the video, but this was on New York Times. They had a little short, tiny article and then a, a video of they're interviewing people from the deep state. So I was pretty excited. I thought, oh, my gosh, they're going to like uh, go to the some sort of they're going to go to the council on foreign relations or something like that they're going to talk to uh you know all of these uh, henry kissinger acolytes and other people that are unelected officials running the government and deciding on policy but no it's not they actually just run a a a video with a lot of interviews with government bureaucrats who do helpful things you know they may as well have just gone down to your dmv and said this is the deep state or something (laughs) i mean it was a very strange shallow superficial thing um, David, why, what is, what do you make of the mainstream? And even now with all these conversations about the continuity of us foreign policy and such, they still can't uh, honestly address these issues. They, they, they can't even talk about them in a serious way where they like actually even look like what are the serious, you know, critiques that people present when they talk about the deep state, what's with all the bullshit. Well, look, this has been going on for a long, long time. Uh, at least since the Cold War, when the great sociologist at Columbia University, C. Wright Mills, wrote uh, the bestseller, The Power Elite. It was heavily critiqued by Arthur Schlesinger, uh, the historian, among other people. 
uh, when it came out back in uh, the late 50s. And um, of course, other uh, people on the left, other scholars have attempted to understand how power truly operates in this country. What Mills was doing in the power elite uh, in a pioneering way was suggesting that the people who wielded real power in this country were not what the traditional pluralist model would say, uh, you know, different sex uh, interest groups, uh, farmers, businessmen, labor, organized labor. That was what uh, we are told in class in the 1950s and 60s. But he said, no, uh, the power elite really runs the country. And these are the people elected and unelected who are at the top of the American pyramid, the generals, the intelligence officials, the corporate executives uh, who meet in groups like the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, and they quietly work at policy behind closed doors. And then uh, they often get government uh, to enact it, uh, both Republican and Democrat. So that's the true deep state, that's the people who work in the DMV, they're the people who are very, very wealthy and powerful, who run the country, and they run it in an organized, quiet way. Now, some would say, I'm a conspiracist. I believe in conspiracy. Well, guess what? That's the way power does function. Power whispers. Power is quiet. Power talks to each other behind closed doors. They don't announce their plans until they're ready to invade a country or overthrow a government. Then they have the media do their heavy lifting for them and prepare the American people for uh, that uh, traumatic event, whatever it is. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin, WMD, 9-11, uh, you know, the assassination of JFK. So uh, those are the true deep events, as Peter Dale Scott, the former UC Berkeley scholar and others who've they uh, truly uh, have documented. Right. That was a big part of my own um, dissertation is to say that social science really got away from that in the United States. They, they, it was C. Wright Mills was the most famous social scientist at the time, a sociologist out of Columbia, and he wrote The Power Elite as a, because he was inspired or frightened by a book called Behemoth about the rise of the Nazi state and the way that these cartels and oligarchs uh, sort of turned to the Nazis as a way to make sure that their dominance over society would not be challenged uh, at a time of great, you know, economic hardship and political hardship in the wake of World War I. And, and he, it, the issue is top down and uh, is it, it's a top down minority rule kind of a system. And he explained how it worked as best he could suss it out in the 1950s. And he himself says, look, it's not, I'm not saying it's all conspiracy. I'm also saying it's not all structure or fate or, you know, geological forces uh, like tectonic plates. Like there's the you do need to understand the structure of the system, but that that structure affords certain people a lot of power. And in the, our system, it's wealth, wealth, organized wealth translates to political power. And that's why we get this system. That's why these guys can be like, uh, we should have a CIA so we can just go around and make events come out the way we want to. I mean, it's it's a pretty straightforward way thing you can understand the way that it's been done, and they don't want to admit that the 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 big democracy has become a cover story in the United States, and the and 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 that's a since it is a going conspiracy, and the New York Times is in on it. They want us to think that this is that what we see is somehow related to democracy, and it's messy, and if if people weren't so polarized and could get along, it would be different. But the continuity is so. Uh, striking over uh, across administrations, you've got to explain it. That's that's what it comes down to. Yeah, it, it's interesting to see again this term "deep state" deployed in in this way. Uh, there's been a sort of well, even after Peter Dale Scott coined the term, which he now sort of uh, walks back from uh, because of what happened afterwards. But even after that, it wasn't really in popular use until the Trump era. Until uh, around 2015, when there started becoming talk of Trump fighting the deep state, where there, there was, uh, you know, people going on Alex Jones and talking about how Trump's going to reopen the 9-11 investigation and he's going to release all the JFK documents because he's against the deep state. Uh, it started being used to mean like, you know, 
uh, an actual secret part of the government that has nefarious activities, which is closer to Peter's original than what it's now become. Because now there's been sort of a, a reclamation by liberals of the term um, where they just use it to refer to the unelected bureaucracy, uh, you know, the EPA, the, uh, the, the federal agencies and all that stuff, and sometimes even the national security state. Uh, and they capture the undemocratic nature of what the, the deep state is, but they're actually saying that that's a good thing, that there are some parts of the government uh, inoculated from democracy. Uh, but even among the, the people who do talk about, you know, deep states and double government, uh, they stray away from what I think Peter Dale Scott's biggest point is, is that the overworld of private wealth and the underworld of organized crime are actually linked. And it's not just the fact that the overworld of private wealth has structural power in the in the public state over the, you know, the goings on of the world, but that that, that power manifests itself through links with uh, high criminality. And low criminality. Uh, in fact, the entire process of criminality is uh, sort of wrapped up in this concept of the public state. Well, while there's also a section of that state that's also engaged in that same criminality. Uh, and so these, you know, you know, I think you talked a bit about the, the Fukuyama piece about the deep state. And there's been a few, uh, you know, articles in places like the American Prospect, which is a, you know, progressive uh, liberal magazine that focuses on actual government policy. But again, when they're talking about the deep state, they're just talking about the unelected bureaucrats and not capturing this link between, you know, you know organized crime and drug trafficking and, uh, you know, deep events. Uh, they're, they're omitting that entire critique. And so while Trump kept some of that critique, this new liberal form of the deep state uh, has completely obliterated that. And, and both forms of, of course, are very unhelpful to any sort of serious analytical work that, uh, you know, you you did in your book and you did in, you know, both of you did in your books and Peter Dale Scott does in, in, in his work. Yeah, he, Aaron and Bryce, let's talk about a little more about the deep state in the era of Trump and Biden, because I think it's very important for people to understand it today. Uh, historically, as we talked about, uh, C. Eric Mills and others like Carl Oglesby, the former president of Student for a Democratic Society, the Vietnam Anti-War Group, and the Radical Group. He also attempted to understand the deep state in his era, which was more the 60s, 70s, 80s. And he wrote a book called The Yankees versus the Cowboys. He said the deep state was um, divided between Texas uh, oil money, essentially, and New York. Uh, corporate money, Wall Street, and so forth. That was interesting. Uh, G. William Domhoff, who I studied under, wrote a book called Who Rules America. He was an uh, acolyte of C. Wright Mills in the uh, 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, so there's been a number of people who attempted, scholars and others and journalists, to understand how power, power really uh, functions in America. But today, as I spoke about, uh, I think, uh, during the Trump presidency, um, I think the deep state has metastasized since 9-11. I think it's a very big labyrinthine uh, group, a network of groups. Uh, Peter Dale Scott talks about it as if it's the weather, just something that exists from day to day. I think it's more organized than that. I think there are factions, though, within it. I think there are factions of the deep state, for instance, that are aligned with Donald Trump, that are more uh, fossil fuel industry, uh, more extractive industries, polluters. Um, the world that he would bring to bear, I, I fear, in a second Trump presidency is a really uh, scorch earth policy uh, involving exploiting the earth, exploiting uh, the resources, uh, those are the industries behind Donald Trump. I think uh, Biden represents a faction of the deep state that is actually more progressive, slightly more pro progressive on climate change and women's issues uh, and racial issues. Um, uh, that's the Democratic Party. But the Democrats, unfortunately, my party, or was my party, have become a party of war, as we've talked about. Uh, on the show. 
And uh, there's not a war in the uh, globe, on the globe, that the Democratic Party hasn't either started or uh, funnels weapons to or uh, helps fuel. Uh, I think that's a, a tragic, tragic, uh, as Bobby Kennedy Jr., among others, has pointed out, is a tragic development. And you've written about the neocons, Aaron, and how they've taken over the Democratic Party, uh, despite Victoria Newland's recent uh, firing, I think it was, um, from the Biden White House. So uh, I believe that the deep state that we look at today is actually more than one deep state. It's a, it's a series of network of factions of people behind the scenes who pull the strings. Biden and Trump are just their puppets. Yeah, yeah I think uh, the, uh, the Oglesby thesis has some problems, but it's an interesting it's an interesting one. Have you ever read that, Bryce, the Yankee Cowboy War? You know, I actually started the, the first couple of chapters recently. And, you know, its basic thesis is that... Um, uh, you know, like the, the JFK and Watergate uh, events are linked, but they represent a sort of push and pull of these factions of, of you know, the deep state, which, you know, that there's, there's something to that if you look at, you know, partisan politics in America. Uh, but that's partisan politics is just one way that that, uh, that expression of power manifests itself. Uh, if we take it back to, again, the Biden and Trump administrations, well, the deep state doesn't just incorp- uh, encompass those uh, those forward facing uh, aspects of, uh, you know, the political elite, the overworld, uh, those forward facing aspects that, uh, you know, engage in elections, uh, put money into PACs, et cetera, et cetera. It also represents a, a bipartisan consensus uh, and something like, um, you know, the anti-China push, for example, that's been going on uh, since the. Obama administration's pivot to Asia, and uh, and that happened as China started becoming, uh, you know, uh, more of a global superpower. Both factions, if you want to call them both factions, if you you can also say that they're the same faction, at least on this issue, uh, have been hell bent on reacting to China's rise in some way, and it's the same with uh, Russia. Uh, there's been uh, almost pretty much unanimous support for this proxy war in Ukraine. Uh, and that until uh, recently, I mean, now some Republicans are saying pull the plug. Yeah, until recently, but I, I mean, e- even then, the, within the uh, political establishment, within the the think tank consensus, it was almost unanimous. There were a few outliers who were like, you yeah, know, this is probably not a good idea for obvious reasons, but uh, they were drowned out. And so, when we talk about these different factions that are competing, it, it, they're also on lockstep on a lot of issues. And on every issue, there seemed to be a different alignment of these uh, these nodes, so to speak. Uh, these nodes coalesce in different forms uh, based on the issue at hand. Uh, if we're looking at, uh, uh, you know, the, the fight between the public state and the deep state, it takes something like the, the drug trafficking network in Afghanistan. Um, well, at what point is there a faction of the public state that's genuinely concerned about, you know, drug use and heroin and, uh, you know, the, the toll on American life expectancy and whatnot. And to what extent is there another faction that is obviously, you know, colluding with Karzai and was colluding with the, uh, the other networks that were pushing these drugs in there? Uh, it's a difficult question, and it's hard to judge exactly where those divisions lie because it's all so obscure, uh, but it makes the business of examining the deep state more uh, more important rather than just saying that, uh, you know, it's it's just these guys uh, 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 in Washington who are just doing their jobs every day. <laughs> it's just bureaucrats. Yeah. Now, David, you one the one issue that I think we're all in agreement on that they the 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 bulk of the establishment, the deep state uh, is thoroughly behind is just U.S. global dominance. And uh, you you're you wrote a recent article at the Kennedy Beacon and you're calling for Kennedy to meet with Pope Francis uh, on a number of issues, really peace in a number of places, Ukraine, Gaza. I mean, that we could really have, I, I think that sensibly we could have diplomatic ways to work out uh, a, a resolution of these conflicts. And, you know, this is a bit dicey given uh, Kennedy's support for, uh, you know, for Zionism is very aggressive support for it. Uh, even as he criticizes the neocons and criticizes the the war machine, 
is those seem those things seem kind of incompatible. I mean, you you can't dial down the empire and stand up to the neocons and be completely in favor of of Israel. Those are kind of totally in contradiction. And yet, you're still saying that it would be that this would be a way to kind of re. Um, it, it's a, a a a remix of the the movements for peace in the time of Kennedy when you had a a pope who was more for peace and you had someone in the White House. And, you know, the Pope, uh, he died shortly. Some, some people suspect he was poisoned. I don't really have any opinion on that back in the 60s. But, uh, and, you know, Kennedy dies as well. So now you're, you're calling for this. Why do you think that the time is right for, for something like this, for a presidential candidate to meet with the Pope and call for world peace? Well, look, uh, Aaron, I think, uh, as you do probably, and Bryce, uh, the, the world seems to be spiraling out of control on Gaza, on Ukraine. When you have war, the environmental, the human uh, toll is enormous. And it destabilizes the entire world, particularly in in this nuclear era. So JFK was, as you know, a very visionary president. And uh, the progressive journalist, uh, Norman Cousins, who was uh, pro-peace, Unitarian, came to him and said, look, I can set up a back channel with Pope John the 23rd, who is also a very progressive uh, Pope uh, in 1963. Um, would you uh, do that? And with Nikita Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union in Moscow. And so JFK jumped at that chance. And there was a back channel uh, about world peace between JFK and the White House and Pope John in the Vatican and Nikita Khrushchev. Uh, engineered by Norman Cousins, the journalist. And that resulted not only in Kennedy's peace speech, which we've talked about, a very important historic speech that everyone should listen to. It's on YouTube, which he delivered in June 63 at American University. It also resulted in the first major treaty of the Cold War era, the limited nuclear ban on atomic testing above the ground. Because Kennedy, as I point out in this article, had found or a scientist in the White House had told him that there were traces of radioactivity in kids' teeth, their bones, and even in women's breast milk. So he knew that he had to do something dramatic to stop this terrible uh, atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons, which he did. There was a major bill. Uh, passed by Congress, ratified by Congress in September 1963. So I suggest that Bobby, uh, now Bobby Kennedy, the nephew of President Kennedy, should do the same. Pope Francis, as we all know, uh, in Vatican terms, is very progressive, but he's not in great health. He's quite old. And I've urged Bobby uh, privately and also in this article to meet with the Pope and call issue a joint call for world peace. That includes Gaza, where the Pope, Pope Francis, has called for an immediate ceasefire. He says, stop the killing, stop the bombing right now. So I thought this was an opening. Bobby Kennedy should use it as a devout Catholic. Uh, obviously, Bobby Kennedy, uh, like his family, is a devout Catholic, and he should meet with this pro-peace pope at this point. Not only would be, uh, I think, a historic call for world peace when we desperately need it, but be a game changer, I think, for Bobby's campaign as well. So I hope this meeting does occur uh, when it's uh, not too late. Right, because it seems to me that it's not just that the call for peace is something that we should have always been behind in these different areas. It's also that the way that the wars are playing out now, it does not seem that they are going to work out in ways that are good for the American deep state, for the American empire, the global dominance project. It actually seems untenable, even from a uh, an amoral perspective, even if you're thinking like just the whole co- pros- the whole project of trying to run the world and to exploit all these countries and make as much money off of taking their resources as possible. This whole project is horribly immoral. It's that it's actually tottering now and is probably always was unsustainable and farsighted people like Kennedy, who back in the sixties were calling, he was supportive of third world nationalism. You know, the kind of thing that we saw with Sukarno and Nasser and the non-aligned movement or in the seventies, it was the 
um, new econ international economic order they were calling for, or Gorbachev uh, was speaking really to the third world, the global south, at the end of the Soviet Union saying, let's have a new world order with massive debt relief uh, for third world countries in a new kind of, you know, more enlightened, peaceful world. And they, it, the, it wasn't meant to be. These forces in the U.S. For, for empire were too powerful, but now they do not have that power, and that is opening things up. And I mean, I think we're even starting to see some reality um, seep into the discussion with Chuck Schumer, who is, you know, a, as much of a deep state, you know, swamp man uh, as anybody there is. But he was calling for a new, this was last week, calling for a new election in Israel. Uh, and I mean, to an extent, he's really blaming a lot more of this on Netanyahu, when unfortunately, there is just a consensus in Israel that is basically for these kinds of policies. But whatever they want to say, if they want to pin it on Netanyahu and then stop it by getting rid of Netanyahu, at least it would stop the slaughter. Uh, what do you make of this, of, of Schumer saying essentially what I've been saying is the case that Israel cannot hope to succeed as a pariah opposed by the rest of the world? I think it's as simple as that because I think that was always the case. And that's why there was always some level of restraint in the past. And you had people like George H.W. Bush saying, you need to organize a two-state solution because this is actually going to make the rest of the world hate us. Uh, and he didn't succeed. But he, but now we're finally getting to the point where it's call, it's jeopardizing Israel. Like, I don't think Chuck Schumer is saying this out of a place of like being a critic of Israel like I am, but we but he and I both recognize that what's obvious. And th what do you make of this, uh, David? Is this progress? Yes. <laughs> Bryce can, uh, I think, uh, talk more eloquently about this. But yes, I think what Chuck Schumer did as the leading, as he put it, Jewish politician in America, as uh, the Democratic uh, majority leader in the Senate, uh, lashed out Netanyahu, said he was the obstacle to peace, uh, calling for a two-state solution. Uh, yes, I think it's a major step forward. I think uh, that the crack finally is starting to occur within the very, very powerful, very influential Israel war lobby. And uh, the cabinet, the war cabinet around Netanyahu, I hope will fall. And I hope, as Chuck Schumer said, that there will be elections soon in Israel and he will fall, Netanyahu. Because I do believe, yes, it's true that he uh, represents a certain aggressive uh, tendency within the Israel Israeli body, body politic. Uh, and there are others like him uh, in power. But I do think he has played a really noxious role in Israel politics for decades. I think you can tie the uh, assassination of Itzhak Rabin to his forces in Israel, uh, if not to him personally, and everything ever since. Uh, Israel has been on the wrong course ever since the assassination of Rabin uh, decades ago. So, yes, Netanyahu's fall, I think I would celebrate it, and uh, many, many people around the world would celebrate it as well. Yeah, this uh, this change by Schumer is surprising, mostly because uh, it's surprising to see the U.S. wade into internal divisions inside of Israel rather than the other way around. Uh, you know, there's uh, all, even before the, the war started, there was always a contentious battle between these factions in Israel, between Netanyahu and his opposition. Uh, but uh, Schumer seems to be putting a wedge in that opposition where none exists currently in actual Israel. Uh, they In Israel, they don't seem to be divided over this issue of, you know, two states. They don't seem to be divided over this issue of how we should treat the Palestinians. There might be tactical issues as to how you best go about uh, the oppression of the Palestinians. Um, uh, but the other issues just seem general political, like a, on a personal level. It doesn't seem like there's a movement within Israel that wants to take Israel in a completely different direction than the way Netanyahu's been taking it. Uh, but Schumer seems to be uh, trying to make that case to American audiences, trying to make it seem like if Netanyahu leaves, then, you know, uh, the peace and harmony is just around the corner. But uh, to me, that just doesn't seem to be the case. The people who are better, best positioned to benefit from uh, a power vacuum created by Netanyahu's departure seem to be just as ghoulish, just as lunatic, and just as committed to genocide 
as Netanyahu is. It, it just might take a different form. It might, uh, you know, uh, have a different constituency specifically within the American political establishment. Uh, but I don't necessarily think that uh, Netanyahu being you know, removed or replaced uh, is on its face a positive step. But let's talk, Aaron and Bryce, let's talk a little about Israel and the deep state. I think this is a turning point. Um, the war lobby in Israel has ruled, as you know, uh, American politics virtually since the beginning of Israel, uh, with some pushback during the Kennedy years on the and bomb, which he did, did not want to transfer to Israel, and he was a major obstacle to that. But after Kennedy was removed, basically the U.S. under LBJ and every successive president has been very pro-Israel, aggressively so. And our uh, dollars have kept Israel afloat. But I think this is a major uh, development uh, because it does represent a major break within the uh, support of American uh, Jewish population for Israel. And I think Netanyahu, I disagree with you somewhat, Bryce. I think there is a democratic movement in Israel. It may be, uh, you know, quieted by the war, the current war in Gaza, but it was about to topple or came close to toppling Netanyahu even before the hostilities broke out in Gaza. And I think actually the war, as we talked about uh, on the show, in some sense saved his ass, saved Netanyahu. And I think that democratic movement in Israel still exists and is prepared, I think, to replace Netanyahu after uh, things settle down in Gaza. But so, that, uh, oh, that democratic movement has a very peculiar meaning in Israel. Um, because remember, they weren't you, like protesting against Netanyahu over his treatment of Gaza or his treatment of the Palestinians or like, uh, you know, the militarized nature of the society. They were protesting, uh, as I understand it, about his general corruption and more acutely his plan to remove the uh, judicial review from uh, you know Supreme Court. But uh, is that a democratic movement when you challenge? That is, but it doesn't. It is. Uh, it court? is a more democratic than Netanyahu is. Uh, but it's I wouldn't an anti necessarily Netanyahu thing more more than dem than pro democracy. I, I would, I would right. say. They're not calling for rights for the Palestinians. They're not calling for to include them in the democratic process. They're just saying that for all, us, the racial supremacists, we want our democracy to run a little smoother. Yeah, you know, I heard Mearsheimer saying that Israel politics, basically the mainstream of Israel, there's no, the Rabin side of it, which was never that, he wasn't as to the as progressive or pro-peace as like the Kennedys were, for example, but at least there was some sort of movement that was somewhat for um, well, he was pro the uh, Oslo you know, and that's why he was killed by the uh, religious extremists aligned with Netanyahu. Uh, yeah. He he believed in a two state solution, and he was trying to uh, give territory land to the Palestinians. So yes, he was a militarist in some ways. He was a former general, but he was pro peace because he understood that it was pragmatic to be pro peace. He was yeah. not, I don't think, a principal ideological <laughs> pro peace guy. But he understood that within the world context, it was the right thing to do. And he was killed for that reason. Yeah. And I, I think the left has a difficult time sussing out what is going on with, is, with Israel and the U.S. because many people want to just make the argument that really what, what Israel is doing is just what the U.S. does and that it's really a proxy for the U.S. I don't believe, I don't really believe that. And I think that what we're seeing now. With, with Chuck Schumer is a good indication that the, it's actually, there are elements of the U.S. That are, that are establishment that are worried about Israel acting in, acting on its own for what it sees as its own best interests uh, in ways that are damaging to the U.S. And that the U.S. and Israel both, there's a neocon consensus and it has guided them towards disastrous policies, NATO expansion, the war on terror, all of these are neocon projects uh, the, the Arab Spring Wars, the fact we still have soldiers in Syria, that's not for it being such a great investment for the U.S. It's not even, yeah, they're stealing the oil, but it's not worth be, just being global bandits to go out and steal Syria's oil. It has to be thought of as something that is being done for the benefit of Israel. 
because Israel has enormous power within the, what, the American deep state, the American establishment. There's nothing else like it wherein all these institutions and civil society and elsewhere, you know, in, that, in academia, uh, they're all uh, terrified of uh, of Israel and getting flack from the Israel lobby. They have well, let me systematically ask you, eliminated opposition to Israel let, because no institutions can speak against them. That's let, really something. Let me flip the, the role here and ask you, Aaron, as someone who studied this, and you, Bryce, as well. What do you think is going on? A lot of analysts say Israel is the tail that wags the dog. It's actually, as Aaron was implying, Israel is actually a super-sized, supercharged colony, client of the U.S. In some ways, in many ways, it's Israel, smaller, much smaller Israel, that wags the dog, the U.S. dog. So again and again, uh, whether it's the war, uh, the invasion of Iraq, um, and our Middle East policy in general uh, serves the interests of little Israel. We don't serve the interests of the oil states. People, as Aaron knows, historically, ran Truman at the time Israel was founded, were saying, look, we should be pro-Arab. They have the oil. Why do you think we are the deep state, or at least a big faction of the deep state, is so closely aligned with Israel? I think that there is... It, because it's not simply Israel, it is Zionism, which is a unique thing in global politics and world history in the last couple centuries, in that it is not squarely tethered to a nation state, although that's its you know objective is to really create an unassailable state. Uh, it, it has enormous power in the U.S. that goes beyond just a foreign country. You have people in the United States with a tremendous amount of money who support and defend Israel to the point that it, any institutions small. I've been at three different high schools, independent high schools, and seen them in different ways kowtow. Well, I was at two of them, and then one of them I know about because it's in the area, and I know friends that work there. But they cow they have kowtowed to Israel in kind of embarrassing ways because of flack or the, even the fear of it. So if even high schools are afraid to to speak about this and teachers when i taught i was like I, I told my students straight up i was like i don't really talk that much about israel because you can't talk about it honestly and i don't feel right telling you things that i know are bullshit and so i, so I wouldn't say bullshit so i'm just not going to cover it very much if you want to study it somewhere you're gonna have to study it outside of this class and i figured that even if they went home and complained to their parents then what would they if the, and their parents complained about me saying that then that would only prove my point you know <laughs> so i just wouldn't talk about it it's that it's that crazy. And they were able somehow to, uh, I think, incrementally gain more power in the U.S. They gave Henry Harry Truman, as I understand it, a huge campaign contribution that probably could have been decisive because he ver he barely won. He It was an upset when he defeated uh, Dewey in 1948. I, I think that the that Zionists have had at different points to blackmail on people in the U.S., uh, in the U.S. system, Epstein, for example, seems to be a part of that. I believe that there has, was something of a tug of war in the clandestine world, in the deep state, over who would really have management of some of the most explosive and sensitive covert operations that we see day to day. And when you think about Watergate, that was in part a, a war over the control of the state. And Nixon, who was a nationalist, had this still amorphous opposition in the deep state that he, even he didn't really understand. Supposedly at the end of his life, uh, in his later years, he would drink whiskey and talk to Frank Gannon. And he would say that if he, he was asked who's behind Watergate, he would say the same people that killed Jack Kennedy. And I think that's basically correct. But I, I think that it's partly because Israel is likely intertwined with that clandestine underworld uh, because they of the situation of Zionists even before the creation of Israel, that we don't really understand how all of these things operate. You know, Lansky retires in to Israel, and in 1971, there's this letter from him where he says, Nixon's trying to take over. I mean, how strange is that? And somebody, and Peter Dale Scott writes in Deep Politics and the Death of JFK, sexual blackmail was the reason for Lansky's uh, power in Washington, you know, and, and he was connected to all sorts of people. Um you know, the Jimmy Hoffa, Irving Davidson, and so on, like a, a whole lot of people. So I think that that's become a part of the clandestine world that is that is strong. And I think it's born in part of 
the existential threat that the Holocaust represented, and then kind of an overreaction and paranoia among uh, hardline Zionists uh, that that the means always justify the ends. And uh, I, I think that just like the rest of this, I mean, really what it is, is that uh, as Americans, we also have a criminalized netherworld connected to the underworld uh, that, that has a big part in governing. So in a way, we're all Israelis now. We've all been living, we're all, we're very similar countries in that we both have this like kind of dark force that's bent on like domination and is paranoid about any threat to it. And so the ends always justify the means. No amount of lying is ever too much. And I think it's all coming to a head. It's coming to the head with the U.S. that, that sort of joined with them in this crusade for the U.S. as a unipolar power with nobody that could ever assail it. That came from a, a neocon, Paul Wolfowitz, the Wolfowitz Doctrine. H.W. Bush said, this is too crazy even for me, and I'm a Bush. And they put the kibosh on that. But eventually those people carry the day, especially under George W. Bush. And they are intertwined with the, with the, the right wing militarists and oil people, the military industrial complex, and the uh, you know the, the, the big oil, it, big oil industries. They're all wrapped up in this unipolar dominance project. That now both parties are doing dumb things. What's happening in Israel and Gaza is is fo very foolishly aggressive, I believe, and detrimental to the state of Israel and its continued existence. And what the U.S. is doing in Ukraine is so stupid it is really only adding great uh power to the forces that are ultimately going to uh overtake the the u.s empire and i, and I believe create a new international system so we don't know how to how to deal with these irrational forces and the fact that it's related to israel and nobody wants to be you know the, the paranoid anti uh anti-jewish person because i don't want to be making these arguments to be honest i wouldn't like to be i'd rather i, I wish that the the facts kind of pointed in some different direction, but the, Israel has an outsized role in our in the, at the pinnacle of power and in the clandestine state. I think specifically, and in that way, it just shows how much our ignorance of our own history is is hurting us because we can't speak to these things because there's so many deep secrets of this whole historical period that we're we're confused and we're afraid to say anything that's going to like make us look like you know nuts. Anti-Semitic. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I got to say, I mostly uh, agree with the uh, the analysis that uh, Israel is an integral part, or at least the uh, the decision-making power uh, of America is connected in large part to the decision-making powers in Israel, and that has historical reasons. I mean, if you go back to the the even the pre-Israel period, and we look at the uh, the Zionist movement and their organizations in different countries. Uh, the they were linked in a lot of ways to the underworld, the, the underworld of organized crime, and uh, you know the that world that that Meyer Lansky world was connected again to these clandestine elements in Israel. Uh, and after the state was or as the state was being created, some of these organized crime networks in America helped you know fund and arm the incipient state of Israel. Uh, it goes back that far, and the uh, you know like every other uh interest group in Washington, their power depends on their ability to organize other levels of decision making power. And Israel, by virtue of uh, you know, again a lot of reasons, uh, historical reasons, uh, had a lot of support in the American Zionist movement, uh in uh, the Jewish community, and also in the, the Christian Zionist movement. Uh and it, it, they were also able to combine those sorts of uh constituencies with the interest of uh, oil majors in some way. Uh, now you talk about the, uh, well, why would America favor Israel when the Arabs have the oil? Um, well, they're, they didn't seem to have too big of a contradiction with that because Israel was a way of keeping that region of the world in check to some degree. Uh, now that has since become a liability, but because of the levels of organization that were built up throughout the 20th century, uh, well, then there's an inertia that has captured the Washington decision-making uh, uh, establishment uh, that has carried on to, uh, through Iraq and through all these other disasters and now are really showing themselves with this Gaza disaster. Uh, and it's to the point where uh, other countries that used to be part of this coalition are, are now asserting themselves as sort of independent. Specifically, I have in mind Saudi Arabia, which, again, like Israel, some people consider to be a U.S. proxy, but that's not entirely correct. Um, not they anymore. are, yeah, certainly not anymore. 
they are asserting themselves as a global power. They're, uh, you know, flirting with the BRICS bloc. They are, uh, you know, issuing statements publicly contradicting the U.S. Uh, the U.S. line on Palestine, and uh, they, uh, but they still aren't fully away from the West. You know, they still allow their air sp- airspace to be used for the U.S. to bomb Yemen, uh, but the Saudis themselves, who fought a brutal war against Yemen for uh, nearly a decade, have now walked that back and said, okay, well, we want a peaceful solution because this is more in our interest. And so all all these different factions around the world are asserting their independence from this, uh, you know, this neoconservative and Zionist consensus that was embodied in U.S. uh, decision-making establishments. Uh, And so it hasn't been, uh, it's not necessarily wagging the dog, uh, but it certainly has a significant degree of influence on how the dog is moving. Uh, like like I just every one time, Bryce and Aaron, I think your comments were very good uh, and very educational for me as well. Can I just add one thing, uh, which we haven't talked about? I think I just saw the movie, which was uh, one, I think, best foreign film at the Academy Awards recently, uh, Zone of Interest. And it was about uh, Rudolf Haas and his family. Rudolf Haas was the Nazi official who oversaw the camp, a concentration camp, the death camp at Auschwitz, one of the more notorious camps uh, during the World War II. And uh, according to his film, they lived happily, he and his family, their kids, in a garden uh, house uh, right next to the crematorium. And they saw the smokestack every day, every night, that was burning people alive, men and women and children. And we know that millions died in that war and were killed very efficiently by the Germans because that's what the Germans uh, perfected during the war, uh, ways to kill people. So um, I think that the Holocaust uh, traumatized Jewish people. And I think it led to their moral power, actually, because they said never again. And it was righteous when they said never again, because of what they had endured for many years in Europe and elsewhere, uh, but particularly during the Holocaust. And uh, as a liberal uh, kid growing up in L.A. during the Cold War, I was taught by my non-Jewish, very uh, Protestant family uh, to re- like to revere Israel because Israel was a a sanctuary for the Jews, and the Jews had been persecuted for so long. And my friends in school, most of my friends were Jewish. I hung out with Jewish kids, I dated them, uh, Jewish girls and so forth. So that was the liberal experience for many people in New York and LA where uh, Jewish populations were concentrated. So I think uh, that there is a uh, connection that people feel a kind of personal connection to the state of Israel. Even now, I feel like I want to endorse Israel's right to exist, even though I know it is a warrior state, even though I know it's killing people uh, indiscriminately, men and women, children in Gaza right now. And it's really a war crime, as the UN just said. It's a holocaust. It's another holocaust. So I think what I was told uh, at UC Santa Cruz as a student by a speaker there is still true. The Jews jumped out of a burning building in Europe in World War II, and they landed on Palestinians, on the Palestinian people. That's what happened. It's a very, very tragic turn of events. And as a result, partly of that trauma that the Jewish people endured and saying never again, Jews on this country become very, as we have to say, very influential, the Jewish lobby, the Israel lobby, in uh, the news media, where I work, in Hollywood, where I was raised, uh, in other key industries that control uh, the or influence the way we look at the world. And so we're bombarded every day with these uh, uh, Israel messages. And now a crack has developed because the war in Gaza is such a disaster on humanitarian terms that we can't look away. It's so repulsive, so disgusting what Israel is doing to the Palestinian people that uh, even Chuck Schumer has spoken out against it, these atrocities. So um, I think we're at a turning point. 
and it's a good turning point. But I want to include that historical element about the Holocaust because I think it is very important. In Maybe it's a deep state thing, maybe not, but it's really true uh, in the hearts of most American people why uh, we support Israel and why the support has gone for so long. Yeah, existential threats are for civilizations, for societies, they warp them in horrific ways. It was Thomas Hobbes wrote, wrote um, Leviathan, which was really saying you should submit to the power of the state because it's a dangerous world out there and only the state can protect you. In the West, that's the basis for like cold hard realism, but it kind of came out of the, the psychopathy of being under war. If you look at China and Japan, they had warring states periods that lasted for a long time. And the brutality of all of that was just and and all of the they all had to think the same way. They all had to be equally as brutal, or they would just be the next one to be killed. It's Game of Thrones. The series on HBO was based loosely on the War of the Roses, which was you know about that time period, a period of like long standing war between you know different factions. So it's like that that mentality has just you know metastasized, I think, in in Zionism, and it became sort of maximalist, obsessed with uh, making sure there's never any Palestinian state defining its security uh, in sort of eliminationist terms. And that's, that's become a more or less the consensus in Israel, and it's a, very powerful in the U.S., but it's, it wasn't stated as such in the U.S. It, people would argue, like, you know, this is what they're doing in Gaza and the West Bank. It really can only lead to either apartheid or genocide or expulsion. Uh, it, it's, it's making any other sort of solution impossible on purpose. And people were saying this for a long time. And then and October 7 happens and the U.S. Acts, the US media acts like it comes out of nowhere. But I, I agree with you that, that uh, it's I think that there is uh, a chance for this to it's it's now on blast in a way. It's now out there in a way that it never has been. And I'm hoping that enough sober people will look at it and uh, embrace something like the Sachs plan, which would be. Uh, recognize people say that a two-state solution is impossible. I don't necessarily think it's the most just thing at this point because I think probably a one-state equal rights uh, polity is much more justifiable. But a two-state solution would give these these crazy dangerous people their special you know their special state, their special ethno state, uh, which is that really something we should be doing in the 21st century. But set that aside, it could be done by the UN recognized a Palestinian state could be very quickly and then give it a body to help administrate it because they're not really aligned the West Bank and, and Gaza. And then you could make this a project for a new, uh, a new world more governed by international law and so on. It, a lot of money could be put in there. You could rebuild things. It, it could, it, we are, we have the resources to do it. We have the ability to do it and it should be done. And it would be for the benefit of everyone compared to the trajectory that we're on now. Because I see it as being a mass slaughter in Gaza that we're headed toward if something doesn't change, and quite like possibly the end of Israel as the rest of the world reacts to it uh, in the face of U.S. De power declining precipitously. So I just, we, I mean, we should just give peace a chance, as you recommended in your article, Dave, but I think that's what it comes down to. Bryce, any last thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I mean, I... I mostly agree with what you said about uh you know the international community needs to be the one to impose a solution on this uh i just it seems harder when you consider the fact that these lunatics are in power they are devoted to their cause and they have nuclear weapons and so it doesn't seem as easy as uh you know the un imposing something on them like i firmly believe that there are at least enough of them uh, who would blow up the world if the if there was a serious threat of imposing a serious solution that would be somewhat equitable to the Palestinians? Uh, and you know that doesn't mean like uh, they have a, a veto power. It means that we need to get creative about how to approach the situation. You know, it's like if uh, apartheid South Africa or if Rhodesia had nuclear weapons. Well, what would we have? What would we have done? And if, if they were willing to use them, what then? Uh, these aren't, uh, these don't, the answers to these questions don't seem readily apparent to me. Uh, but of course, the only way we could get to the point where that becomes an issue is, of course, to move the needle here in the U.S. Well, I hope that that's what's happening right now. And uh, I think that's a good thing to close on is that the needle needs to be moved in the U.S. away from, uh, you know, full throttle self-destruction, because that, that seems to be where we're headed. So 
Uh, Bryce, great to have you here again. And David, always great to speak with you. Good. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Jeffrey K, it's great to have you back. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Aaron. Hey, Bryce. So we want to talk about a new uh, Substack article that you have, which is based on some research that you've been uh, doing for quite a while. I mean, you put a lot into this article, and uh, I, th I thought it was fascinating, and it dealt in with uh, biological weapons and aspects of our history that we didn't know. So I'm going to go ahead and show that um, article here, the headline. It's at your Substack, and we'll link to it. Suppressed for decades, FBI reports suggest Japanese World War II balloon attacks on U.S. and Canada included biological agents. So despite denials going back to 1945, new information reveals several World War II Japanese Fugo balloons. That makes it sound almost fun, like a like Tamagotchi or Pokemon or something. Uh, contained anthrax. Uh, these balloons contained anthrax, while others were suspected of carrying bubonic plague, FBI documents suggest. Um, so what made you go into this area? Because you've done a lot on biowarfare and... Um, the Korean War and the U.S. In, uh, involvement in biowarfare research, but now you're getting into uh, Japan. What led you to uh, start this investigation of yours? Well, it was by, believe it or not, it was purely by accident. Well, kind of by accident, in the sense that uh, somebody had sent me, maybe almost two years ago, um, a uh, a group of documents that they had downloaded or you could have gotten them online i believe at the old site the web the memory hole and uh which is now defunct but you can find it kind of via um the, the web art you know way back machine on the on the internet anyway i was uh, it was about ufos supposedly and so i didn't look at it because it just wasn't my interest although i was aware that there was some overlap between the the personnel involved in the UFO controversies and um, people who were involved in the biological weapons program in the United States. So sooner or later, I was going to get to this, these documents, but it just didn't seem, I didn't want to open that can of worms, you know, the UFOs and all of that. But uh, one day with nothing. So, well, okay, before do, you I, go, before, before yeah. you go on, I'm sorry, that's pretty fascinating to me. And I would wonder what, if you have any hypothesis or theory as to why, that would be because I've always, it, to me, I, I don't mean to disparage people that are looking for life out there, mm -hmm. and it would be cool if it mm -hmm. were true, but it, it always seemed like there was that, like the the more we learn about the UFO stuff, the more that it seems that the people that have been leaking this are kind of have some other agenda, and that they seem to be some sort of psychological warfare thing that they're doing. Do That's you think that part it. of this would be that the UFOs were like there as a potential story to cover for these sort of things? Perhaps I, I would say that's a, a good hypothesis. I can't say I know or that I've studied it enough to have a, a really informed opinion. But from what I can tell, these personal, yeah, you know, what they have in common is that they had uh, histories in psychological warfare department within the U.S. Uh, military or the CIA or both, and um, and that's the overlap for the most part. And uh, certainly. Uh, yeah, they, they were using it as my next article will show, actually, the U.S. had a quite vigorous balloon program of their own, including the use of uh, biological weapons in balloons uh, that they had picked up on, I believe, from the Japanese. Um, and, uh, you know, just as they picked up a number of items that uh, they used in the biological warfare attacks on Korea and China during the Korean War were really um, uh, elements of either sabotage or rudimentary devices, or you know, some of them were kind of sophisticated, but anyway, in which the Japanese at Unit 731 had developed during World War II. And then the U.S. had made an amnesty or had recruited all these former bio Japanese biological warfare figures after World War II, protected them from war crimes and prosecution by via trade off of getting the information that they had developed by these horrendous experiments on human beings and um, live operational trials of biological weapons uh, in the field against both the Soviet Union and uh, mu much more wide scale against China during the, uh, the war between China and Japan that overlapped was part of World War II. And um, so 
Anyway, uh, now I let myself get too far afield in my brain away to your yeah, question. This is just more the, the issue is how you oh, ended up UFO. looking into this specific thing. And uh, yeah, the UFO thing was th- th- is, was <laughs> t- 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 through me. So I began <laughs> looking through and reading. That's fascinating. I scanned the UFO material and I just didn't concentrate. I was just focused on what could I find that was re- might relate to my major research question, which was around the biological warfare in Korea. And I'm reading through and I'm reading through and then I get this one document. This one, these are all FBI, by the way, declassified FBI files. And I see this, I run across this, which is the um, uh, that uh, July 1945 memo to uh, um, uh, Daniel Ladd um, at the FBI, um, who's in charge of domestic intelligence and uh, for the for the Bureau. And um, I just couldn't believe what I was reading. It said, and I think you might have that quote, uh, that, you know, what it was, was, was a memo from an anonymous source, never been, was redacted in the file, who though is recalling, um, or is memorializing rather, an interview or information they got from a special agent in charge at their Norfolk office, which was a kind of brand new FBI office that had been put together because of the national security regions and fear of sabotage around the military um, the military bases uh, in uh, um, near Hampton Roads, Virginia, and Langley Air Force Base, and um, which is not too far from DC itself. So, you know, it was a very important new, brand new field office there, and uh, they were having uh, th- what this memo did was memorialize a um, briefing that their special agent in charge at the Norfolk office got with some other anonymous figure that was redacted. Um, but a military figure at um, Langley Air Force Base who was also had been in charge of uh, or been um, involved in the balloon the intelligence uh, around the Japanese balloon um, attacks. Now, these attacks, by the way, for your listeners sake, had begun very late in 1944. In fact, by by the end of the year, it wasn't even clear there was an attack going on. They didn't know what was happening. There were these couple of balloons. They seemed to come maybe from Japan. And, um and they seemed, uh, and then they found some that had incendiary devices on them, and then uh, later uh, high explosive bombs. And then they, by January, by early January, they knew now there was some kind of attack going on from Japan, and they put down a uh, uh, an iron curtain, if you will. <laughs> it's a terrible analogy, but anyway, they put down a curtain of censorship around the issue. They went to the editor, you know, they met with editors around the nation. They said, please don't report on this. Uh, we're under some type of attack and there could be biological weapons involved. You know, they, they had enough intelligence that they knew the Japanese were interested in, in such things. If they, they, in fact, had not used it already by, by early 1945, the Americans. Do we, and, know, uh, do we know the the which editors were talked to, uh, like which publications were talked to, to, uh, you know, uphold this gag order i think i think some of them have been documented i none of them come to mind right now these were most of this came from secondary sources or just a recall of the general censorship program um mm-hmm. that it was laid out in some military reports i mean 1945 um but uh, I have a few. I have a few quotes here from the article that deal yeah. with some of these earlier documents and the, the points that you're <clears throat> raising here. Um, th- and you included mm-hmm. this photograph, which I appreciate. Uh, this is mm-hmm. what it looked like. So this is a kind yeah. of a flashback. I could trigger for, for people who live through our own the Chinese weather balloon exper- uh, experiment. Um, so it's, so this you're talking about two reports, and it says the most damning of two reports was a. Uh, the 1945 FBI memo uh, at Norfolk office briefed by an official at Langley Air Force Base addressed to the chief of FBI's domestic intelligence, uh, Dan Ladd. Several, recently, several Japanese balloons were found in North and South Dakota and Nebraska, which were determined to have been carrying uh, bacteria and identity is uh, omitted. Um, and then a separate one from 1950 uh, relied on expert opinions inciting unusual out breaks of bubonic plague in certain areas where the World War II Japanese balloons had landed in New Mexico and Alberta, Canada, and the experts believed they were likely due to balloon landing. So you had some actual um, outbreaks of of diseases. Hmm. Uh, The purported fact that the balloons lacked anything that would mark them as biological agent delivery devices was repeated in sundry scholarly examinations of the subject going all the way back 
to U.S. Air Force Major Robert Mikish's 1973 Smithsonian Press booklet, Japan's World War II Balloon Bomb Attacks on North America. So this is something that has been, I mean, they. it seems like they were successful in suppressing the uh, reality of this, of all this. Yes, yes, there, there were, um, uh, um, you know, so for instance, you know, you know, there were some, uh, to speak, to Bryce, to what you said, and I'm just sorry, I, I'm not recalling, I didn't write, a, didn't make it into the article, but there were definitely instances, I think one was in the Des Moines Register, for instance, where they published something about the balloon, a balloon attack, and then they got a phone call, and then it, it didn't make it in the previous edition, or the subsequent mm -hmm. editions of that newspaper. So they, they were on it, they had people all over the country, and the Canadians had them all over Canada. Um, there must have been something in Mexico because there were also some sightings and landings happening down there, but I'm just not aware of what what might have happened down in Mexico. Um, one thing I discovered in all of this was that there were a number of balloon landings that happened in New Mexico. And um, interestingly enough, none of those made it in either my Kesha's report or subsequent other scholarly examinations or any um or a canadian report that i read that was uh, had been a confidential report of the canadian military it was just uh, for some reason there's balloons falling everywhere around it but not in new mexico <laughs> why not new mexico well because new mexico was the site of the manhattan project for the, the main part i believe you know in fact uh um there was um in his autobiography apparently uh uh oppenheimer related an instance in which they thought they saw something like a balloon sailing through there, an unidentified object sailing through the skies. And everyone came out and looked at it and stuff. And and uh, he said, what, what are you all amazed about? And they were told, Oppenheimer was told it was a weather balloon that had just gotten out of, you know, gotten away from them. And, uh, and that's all. So they were hiding these things out. from even the other top secret uh, projects. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. This was very top secret stuff. And um, I have more, you know, I'm, I'm going to be writing an article uh, for the Canada Files, uh, which will talk a bit more about what happened up in Canada, because the Canadian scientists took this very seriously, who are related military, the Canadian scientists attached to the Canada, Canada's Defense Board, which was uh, involved in um, biological warfare research happening during World War II. And... Um, Anyway, uh, how I got into this, so I looked at that and I said, I need more, I saw the lad memo and I said, I need more confirmation. That's just one memo against a sea of claims that there was no biological warfare. Because then I said, well, let me look around. I didn't know much about the balloons. I, I came across this one memo. I knew nothing about really Japanese balloons. I think I vaguely had heard that something like that had happened at one point, but I knew nothing about it. So I had to study the question. Yeah, with yeah. you included another picture here of one of the balloons. Uh, side view of ballast gear showing some of the incendiaries and sandbags in place. So these were pretty elaborate. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're kind of, I guess, sort of a crude idea of just like let's fly balloons over. But they really did put some thought into into this. And there's a mm -hmm. memo you were talking about New Mexico. Uh, you did find a memo from Hoover. Uh, that involved a professor named La Paz who had been doing research on some balloons that had gone to New Mexico. And you suspect that the reason, I think this was a maybe in a 1950 memo, or I don't know the exact year of it, mm -hmm. yeah. but it, it was likely a memo that that Hoover Hoover would have taken an interest in it because of the proximity of the potential balloon attack to the nuclear experiments and such. Right, right. So in fact, Hoover copied his memo to the AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission, and the CIA, and the military. Um, Office of Naval Intelligence, which, which kind of was a water, you know, kind of a clearinghouse for a lot of different intelligence uh, um, interests that were go, you know, going on, because it was it's the oldest intelligence agency in the United States. So, um, yeah, so I, I looked around and I saw this other memo, the 1950 memo, but Half of it was redacted. Um, the name Lincoln La Paz, Professor La Paz at the, uh, the University of New Mexico, that was redacted. Everything about the uh, attacks in Alberta, Canada was redacted. The only reason I know this is I asked for a mandatory declassification. Then. So here was another memo that looked promising that might give me the confirmation that I needed to go with this other memo. So at least I had 
two sources of information about this instead of just one you know memo which is uh um could have been a, a false you know alarm kind of thing um although he pretty clearly said several several of these had been discovered I, you wouldn't i don't think they would have communicated that to the you know to the fbi if they weren't uh, certain about it um they were very much against spreading rumors so uh i amazingly the national archives moved on this quite quickly i, I was shocked and uh, within a matter of a couple of months i had the redact the unredacted memo and discovered that the person in charge uh, who was talking to the FBI was Lincoln La Paz. La Paz was not just an interested professor. Here's where, by the way, some, some more UFO stuff comes in, because um, his uh, he was an expert in meteorites. And he um, kind of tried to debunk some of the UFO stuff as being meteorites, um, for instance, that people saw um, flashing through the sky. Anyway, um, but at that, during World War II, La Paz had been recruited. And he was working for the military, as many people in academia were. And he had been assigned uh, to investigate these balloons. So he, he, he you know, he was um, a, a major investigator in that region in New Mexico. And um, and uh, what got unredacted was the fact that these where these balloons had fallen in the Sandia Mountains. That he had another memo from a Canadian official who I believe was. Uh, uh, the guy in charge of uh, the balloon investigations in Canada for various reasons. And uh, I believe that. And um, because unfortunately, that name still is redacted. And even after they did the mandatory declassification, I don't know why, but they redacted it. But it, he they gave the bulk of his report. And that was about balloons falling in northern Alberta and, and western Alberta um, that had set off, uh, you know, they believed they had signs of plague that had been set off. And then um, in New Mexico, they had actually found dead rats and they had uh, um, sampled them for plague and found plague in them at elevations they claimed it had never been found at. Now, somebody immediately wrote a comment to my article, the first one saying, this is this, you're, you don't know what you're talking about. I know what I'm talking about. And I can tell you there's been no plague found at six to 7,000 feet um, in New Mexico. So already people are, trying to debunk this right away. And, uh, but um, the rats were said to be found near a ski lodge um, in New Mexico, and it's identified the old La Madera Ski Lodge. And they're, you know, I was able to easily look up and see that that's at an elevation of over 8,000 feet. So, it, you know, it may be true that plague was discovered. There has, there had been plague. This is all epidemiological stuff, and it may be too weedy for your listeners, but it's important to scientists, you know, uh, diseases, particularly out in the in the wild, happen, in, you know, in very particular ways. Anyone who followed has followed the COVID story and the bats and you know, all of this stuff uh, or the, the, um, the lab leaks and um, what causes epidemics and pandemics know that it's, 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 it's very particular. There's not like one thing that you can say that does this. You have to look at the facts. And the facts were that these rats were discovered, and more so of interest to me is that they they found that the bacteria the, or the, the version of plague that they found was not typical to what they would find typically in New Mexico, meaning it did not respond to the typical tests that were used. What they probably did, and they didn't go into it in this uh, memo, but I know from the research on the Korea work. Uh, is uh, you know what they would do is they kind of chop up these uh, portions or the use the blood from these dead animals who are potentially infected and then they inject it into guinea pigs and then the guinea pigs get plague and die from what they got from the dead rats then they know that it was plague but there's so other ways had, can... uh, i'm sorry you already had people uh in your messages telling you no i'm an expert on this this is false uh, well, when I published this in uh, Substack, um, he didn't say he was an expert on everything. Uh, that you can, anyone can go to my article and read it. The, the comment is there and my response. Um, but very quickly, he says um, this this has no legitimacy because the uh, um, he didn't speak to anything in the lad memo about anthrax or anything. But I can tell you that you know he didn't say he worked for New Mexico Public Health, but he inferred that he had experience somehow in that and. Um, that he uh that, that plague had been found since 1938 at high elevations from five to seven thousand feet 
Um, but um, in the world of uh, epidemiology and searching out what happens with animals in the wild, the difference between 7,000 feet and 8,000 feet is significant in terms of, you know, you've seen on maps, they draw lines that are delineate, you know, elevations mm -hmm. and what happens in certain areas. The same thing in, with the Alberta outbreaks as well, because in Alberta, uh, there had been um, a scare over the, uh, the infestation of Norway rats carrying plague in the southern part of Alberta, just around the same time. Now, that could have been a cover story for it because there were a lot of balloons that landed in southern Alberta as well. And I don't really know whether or not that was about the, the rats getting in there or whether the balloons had dropped plague and the rats picked it up or the rats or they gave it to chipmunks and the chipmunks got it, gave it to the rats. However, whatever happened there, there was plague. And Alberta as a province kind of freaked out and they mobilized their public health uh, authorities and they did a somewhat famous um, um, campaign to eliminate the Norway rat in all of the province of Alberta, which they supposedly successfully did. But what was of interest to me was that, again, in the lists of bal known balloon sightings from the Japanese uh, barrage, of which there are roughly around 300, um, they only showed like two or three during, in during northern Alberta. Hmm? 300 during, during which well, period? 1945. Okay. Hmm? Yeah, the, the Japanese balloon barrage occurred from roughly November 1944 to April, late March or early April 1945. And um, we don't know all the, I must give everyone the credit to, the, to those who worked so hard. And I got a lot of out of Robert Mikesh, his monograph, uh, and uh, a much more recent monograph by Ross Cohen, a historian, um, you know, who looked very carefully at these materials. I don't believe they saw what I had seen or they wouldn't. Have yeah, you you, uh, you, you point out that uh, Cohen in December 2017, actually, with because he'd written his book, I guess, earlier, and he withdrew his conclusion, uh, which had been based on the post-war denials of Japanese officials. He withdrew his conclusion yeah. that Japan had never plan to weaponize the balloons with biological agents. So I guess he went from that to being agnostic, uh, apparently. Yeah, he didn't, uh, I, you know, I, yeah, I would say I have spoken to him and I would say at this point he is, he, he didn't say anything for to quote for attribution, but uh, I believe, I believe it's fair to say that at the moment he's agnostic while he considers this new information, perhaps we'll see if he comes to a different conclusion. Um, right. but he did change his mind when a memoir from, uh, uh, someone who worked you know, helping make the Japanese balloons laid out from their standpoint, what had occurred. And they were working on a virus known as rinderpest or cattle plague. Sometimes it's called you know, in North America. And it's, it's actually a disease that had not ever occurred in the United, in North America. So if they had dropped rinderpest in here, it would have been quite clear that something was amiss. <laughs> Things, diseases don't, don't appear out of nowhere. And they, you know, they already were suspecting that the Japanese were working on Rinderpest is an article that I did quote. And this is also intricate. I feel while I'm saying it, I hope people are following this. Because it's like I'm throwing out the diseases, Rinderpest, anthrax, neuronic plague. But each of these diseases had their own um, characteristics. And uh, working with them as biological weapons, had each of them had their own particular um, uh, their own particular problems and their own particular needs in, in terms of propagating it if you want to use it as a weapon. It's one reason, by the way, I don't believe COVID was a biological weapon or ever a biological weapon. Whether it was meant to be a biological weapon, I, I still don't think so, but I'll leave that as a slight possibility. Um, that it came from a lab leak certainly is a real possibility, but it, but it had been part of some kind of biological weapons program, unlikely for the reasons that I'm saying here, but I see you. Yeah, it's not, it's COVID isn't very useful as a straight up biological agent because it's like, you're basically, it's like what sort of defense planners would think like, we need a way to kill all the people that are very close to death because statistically that's more or less what the virus, I mean, the, the average right. age of some of the deaths are like 80 or something like that. So it's like, that's no, you're never going to design something as just like a bioweapon to kill people if that's what it does. Like, no, Basically, I don't think they, yeah. You're talking about killing people that are going to be dying soon. That's a very strange kind of weapon, if it's in, in that right. sense, you know. I mean, other people. Well, and you would want to have a weapon. There were other that agendas not that were different. You also want a weapon that's not going to hopefully rebound back on you 
they call it reactivity, react back upon your troops or your population. So hopefully you have uh, um, vaccines. So for instance, the reason that uh, dropping anthrax in Nebraska and North and South Dakota, um, where those balloons fell, um, didn't set off anthrax uh, attack, uh, anthrax outbreaks was probably because, as I point out in the article, those that the Midwest had the very uh, the attacks that the U.S. had uh, made uh, in 1951, 52, 53 on Korea and China didn't work out so well is because those areas had very effective uh, public health programs. They were very, you know, they knew and they were communist countries and they knew how to mobilize their resources and populations in a kind of demand fashion. And uh, and uh, there have been articles written and, and scholarly articles about China's program. And, North Korea's program has been poo-pooed, but it's, uh, they had a pretty good program as well as they were under a tremendous uh, fire uh, attack. It's um, interesting you should bring up this issue of uh, reactivity because, uh, I mean, it's relevant to right now what's going on in, in Gaza, uh, where you have, uh, you know, multiple military officials talking about how, uh, how much it helps them that there's, uh, you know, a disease outbreaks in Gaza because, you know, their goal is extermination. But then you get articles yeah. in the Israeli press talking about how, well, it's not that good. Uh, you know, what if our people get sick? It, it's really sick right, when, you, right. when you think about it. But, I mean, the, they're right. They're talk talking about the very real risks of these weapons and how they're actually going to be operationalized in a combat situation. Right. You know, Kit, the uh, reporter Kit Clarenberg did a, a very interesting article uh, a few months back. Perhaps it was at the Gray Zone, I think, about... Israel's use of biological agents and sabotage way back during the early late 40s, the late 1940s as part of the, you know, the, the NAPCA as part of the uh, ethnic cleansing that they were undergoing uh, there. Um, you know, there is, a lot of, the when you think about, but, hmm? I was going to say it was, it was about poisoning the wells. The way, oh, the wells, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And that's what, yeah, and that's what Unit 731 did. That, that's very much, using uh, biological weapons, um, people think about them as only happening from bombs or whatever, but uh, sabotage uh, is a, a primary method of spreading germs, you know, dropping cholera into wells, um, infected animals. So going back to the earliest uh, um, type of biological warfare where diseased uh, corpses were, you know, propelled uh, over castle walls by catapult um, to, you know, to infect people or at least scare them, cause so panic, which is another thing biological weapons are supposed to do is so panic in a population. Um, I see you've put up a, a picture from uh, one of the Unit 731 tests uh, that we're doing. Right, it's, uh, I think it's a yeah, really grim and horrific things. Uh, I think it's worth looking back now, as we, you know, as we see what got what's happening in Gaza. That they, these are the kind of horrors, this uh, you know, wanton slaughter and just disregard for the humanity of other people that uh, we should be, we should have moved beyond as a species, and yet we are not. Uh, you know, things like this are on the level of like seeing those people zip tied and flattened by uh, Israeli tanks in Gaza. You know, we see these horrific images of these of these things. And, uh, you know, the, it seems Nazi-ish, but of course, this is Japan and they were part of the little Nazi clique there. Uh, and, and it's it's what's amazing about this is that it's, you know, why would the U.S. suppress what its own allies were or what its own enemies were doing in the in the war? I mean, of course, we go on to become Japan's ally. If you can call us that, we basically are mm -hmm. Japan's boss, essentially, mm -hmm. since the end of World War Two. But I mean, this is it's amazing that they cut they've tried to cover up Japan's war crimes as well. And this isn't the yeah. only case of this. I think there's other instances like the aspects of the Bataan death march and the looting of of east asia that they really covered up for different reasons right well the uh, another cover-up really was uh, um about the response to the doolittle raids i think uh, the smithsonian institute uh, did a, an article on this maybe only 10 20 years ago at the most because uh the balloon project was a response to, you know, the U.S. had done very poorly at the beginning after Pearl Harbor. There was a series of defeats and Japan had made a series of victories throughout East Asia. And uh, things weren't looking that great in early 1942. 
and um, Roosevelt uh, um, uh, gave the okay, I guess, to uh, to a, a kind of almost suicidal raid to be launched against uh, Japan's mainland, against Tokyo, and uh, led by uh, um, a flyer by the name of Doolittle, who became famous uh, from this and later. Um, the, the U.S. Is he bombed the same Tokyo. Doolittle who wrote the Doolittle report on the CIA later, because there's like I, one of those I'm not earlier. Sure. Okay. It may be um, he, he, this guy stuck around for a long time and, and, and was heavily involved with CIA and their and stuff and intelligence. But um, what happened was the, the Doolittle pilots flew, you know, they, they had no bases. The U.S. had no bases there. So what happened is they came in, they to us, you know, after they dropped their bombs, they flew over to China and parachuted out what they thought were friendly areas, they had networks of agents that could pick up these air crew and save them from, you know, from the Japanese, which they did. Um, a number of them. And, um, but of course, Japan found out about this, they were furious, and they unleashed hell upon uh, a portion of southeastern, uh, south, yeah, southeastern China, killing roughly a quarter of a million people in reprisals, laying waste to an area of about 25,000 square miles, destroying bridges, ta whole towns, whole towns, 50,000 people wiped out. Um, just horrific, horrific stuff. And this is separate from what we've heard about. You might have heard of the rape of Nanjing, et cetera. Um, so uh, when another thing, so they said is they, they wanted to attack the American mainland. But of course, uh, and they had all sort, they thought of all sorts of different ways to do this. They, um, they certainly could send submarines close to the West Coast and they wanted to launch uh, bombs from planes that could be secured on a submarine and then launched um, and then they came, uh, but there were problems with, with that, very logistic, I guess they were logistic problems. And then the Japanese were starting to suffer some uh, set, naval setbacks as the war was progressing. And uh, some ingenious, truly ingenious scientists at the Noborito Institute in, um, in Japan, this is, that's the mil Japanese military's institute that worked on special weapons, like poisons that you could inject into people and things. They, uh, they came up with this balloon stuff because their scientists had been working on the jet stream, something that in 1942, 43 was not really well known. In fact, people didn't know about it. And um, they were studying the jet stream and how it worked. And they figured out that they could send a balloon um, um, over uh, up way up 30,000 feet and send it in it, and prevailing winds would send it over North America. And if you could do that and send bombs, you can drop, you could set off um, fires, you know, the incendiary devices dropping it on the massive forests that occur, you know, are in the Pacific Northwest and uh, um, British Columbia, et cetera. And uh, also high explosive bombs that you could drop, or if anyone came up and found them and said, what is this? They would, you know, like, you know, they would be uh, blown up. Uh, and, and so panic in America, the way that the Doolittle Raid sowed panic in, in, in Japan. Um, and then so they uh, they had used balloons before, and I show in the article a testimony that's not hardly ever talked about, that they had used uh, balloons, experimental balloons, to deliver um, biological weapons against the Soviet Union early on in the late 1930s, prior to the outbreak of World War II, when Japan and, and the Soviet Union had a few major battles and, 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 and were fighting until... The Soviets basically won, and uh, a truce was made. So through most of World War II, Japan and and uh, the Soviet Union did not fight. There was a kind of un. Um, no, I, I think know, they actually uh, signed a non-aggression pact of sorts. It was, if I right. recall, it was in 1939. They fight. I just there's little skirmishes around the Manchurian uh, right. Soviet border, and then finally. There's a decisive battle at a place called Namohan in 1939, yes. I believe, yeah. and they essentially sign a non-aggression pact, which they adhere to for the duration of the war until the very end when uh, the Soviets sweep into Manchuria and just wipe out the Japanese and they kill more people than the atomic bombs do. And that really was sufficient. The Soviet invasion was going to lead to it did lead to Japan's surrender. That's really why they surrendered, that they had right. lost the last of their extraterritorial empire you know outside of the islands um and so it was done and then the the atomic bombs were basically like a good excuse for them to surrender to the americans uh rather than allow the soviets to invade because they feared that the soviets might just wipe out the entire oligarchy and ruling class and the emperor as well whereas the americans would save the oligarchy because 
America is a country run by capitalist oligarchs, and they can make they they can much more easily deal with Japanese capitalist oligarchs, which they did after the war. You know, the people that run Mitsubishi and Mitsui and all those other mm -hmm. Zaibatsu companies, they get recapitalized with American wealth and um, also with stolen Japanese uh, stolen loot from China and Indonesia and everywhere else. I mean, it's a, a really sordid thing on the whole. Oh yeah, it's uh, so the um, they sent these balloons over, and um, I believe what happened. I didn't come to a full conclusion, uh, I, I, and maybe this is the one fault in the article I have for myself. If I have to rewrite it now, that I didn't really say what my own theory is, which is that uh, they did. You know, they sent these balloons over. They um, were working on uh, different types of biological weapons, and a major. You know, department and department was working on render pest, and I do believe they did decide not to send it because it would have been it would have set off reprisals and been too easy to determine that this had come from Japan. The best biological weapons are ones where you 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 mix up the other side so that they can't be sure where this is coming from. In other words, you have plausible deniability. These are covert operations, biological warfare. You have to think of it as a gigantic covert operation. Um, and, um, you know, because you're, you're, you're breaking all sorts of treaties and, and you're doing something that most people recognize is just horrific. And the, um, so if you send plague over, you know, into areas that have plague, and if you send anthrax into areas that have anthrax, then, you know, uh, you can't know for a while in, in the article, I'm going to write follow up for the Canada files. Um, it's quite clear one of the Canadian scientists talked about how um, the difficulties are having determining, you know, where, where where stuff is coming from, where these attacks might be about, where they could just be natural or they could come from this or that. Um, we need more time. It takes a while. You, um, uh, If you really get into the nitty gritty of this, you just you discover that there are ways to, uh, to make um, determinations more difficult. You mix up the pathogens so that there's more than one. It's, you know, you send anthrax, but you send anthrax with three or four other things. And it's all mixed up together. And if you don't know what you're looking for, you don't know what to test for. It's, it's all sorts of stuff. It, it makes the biological weapons almost the perfect covert <laughs> uh, covert weapon um, in many ways. And in fact, that's how the CIA saw it in the Special Operations Division that they ran out of uh, Fort Detrick and, and MK Ultra experiments that they did, et cetera. It's so a lot of overlap between um you know the the whole mk ultra world and biological weapons as well like there was one program called mk naomi which was mainly about using chemicals poisons and biological pathogens in assassinations and covert sabotage oh yeah and i will i'm certain that we only know the tip of the tip of the iceberg as far as that stuff yeah. goes they like you wrote very about sophisticated this, right? ways to kill people that we don't even that we have no idea I, i'm i would be confident that they could induce cancers in people uh and i have you know i always wondered if they did that to like people like bill hicks and robert perry who just died or right. and also bob marley is another Ruby. one yeah, Ruby. Yeah, Ruby, was, Ruby said it himself. Uh, Ruby said they're it. injecting me with cancer cells. Well, yeah, right, right. Yes. Well, um, that's right. That's what he said. Yeah. So, where um, uh, I, I recommend that people check out your your Substack. Uh, you want to tell people where they can follow your your work? Uh, if there's any place besides the Substack and Twitter. Sure. Uh, well, the Substack, which those. I think is it K K A Y E J. <laughs> dot substack dot com or just type in the name of the blog or newsletter is hidden histories and if you just search for hidden histories at substack you'll find it it's it's a simpler way i think to remember a url and um, i also published for a, a lot of my material at medium.com as well and i think it's just uh, jeff k jeff hyphen k you know dot medium.com is uh, you'll find a number of my articles particularly on korea and the korean war situation and I encourage people to read. This is a detailed story in the sense that it's it's it hasn't been told before. So one reason that it's hard to talk about is there's so much to to put it together for people so that uh, that hasn't been out there. You don't have a knowledge base. Most people anyway don't have a knowledge base upon which to 
everything is new. That's how I found it too. As that, I was that's how I felt it. while reading some of this stuff. I was like, well, yeah, it seems, I mean, impossibly complex. Uh, you've dedicated a lot of time to figuring out, and even you don't need know, know everything about it. Uh, about that's right. It's uh, a that's good microcosm for a lot of our our history. I mean, we don't. There's a very important things we are not allowed to know much about and uh i think the more that we kind of come to recognize that i i think it's um it's an it's unsettling it's disconcerting it's destabilizing but i think it needs to happen as we because it's very much related to the insanity that we see in our own political system it's the it's the accumulative effect of people at the top running things in a sort of despotic way knowing that that's what they're doing and so no being smart enough to know that we have to lie about it and we have to hide these things but then the cumulative effect of this over years and decades is that it, it it's all it's bullshit all the way down uh in many areas like we the, the the prevailing common sense that's acceptable to say for respectable quote-unquote people is so fundamentally uh bullshit because of this factor that we 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 were lied to about this and then we were lied to about it after that and many things that were consequential or subsequent to that we were lied about and then now we're just in a kind of make-believe uh world where it, that doesn't correspond to like what, how things are supposed to be and we know that and that's why people are i think partly it's just a disorienting time and you know i'm hoping this these revelations are going to be healthy and be part of some process of coming to grips with this and i think that your work is a part of this uh, struggle along with work of many other people uh, hopefully my own work and bryce's work you mentioned kit, kit clarenberg he's been on the show before mm -hmm. and they suspended him from twitter mm -hmm. because he did good work uh we just all mm -hmm. got to keep out there hammering it away so i really uh, appreciate right. the work that you've put into this uh, hidden history well, thank you. Just as I appreciate your work very much, too. And I, I totally agree. The disorienting aspect of it, I experienced this first because my research, how I got into this, I think Bryce, you had mentioned versus I, I had been, um, I was a psychologist. I, and part of my work was to work with torture victims. This is a very brief story of it. Work with torture victims. As a result, I became very interested in the question of torture. And when the torture scandal broke during the Iraq war, um, in this country, um, one of the things that was said at the time, well, I wanted it was totally disillusioned to discover that how many of people in my field of psychology, and not just Mitchell and Jessen, but going back into the 1950s, had worked with the government to put together a, a torture program. Um, but um, so that was disorienting for sure. People I thought were almost heroes to me in my field turned out to be monsters. Um, and uh, but one of the things that, one of the, um, almost a footnote, if you will, the New York Times and various histories would say, well, these torture techniques the U.S. came up with, they really were based on other torture techniques developed by the Chinese communists to create false confessions of biological warfare on Korea. They were brainwashed. That was the or whole origin of the brainwashing meme was the Korean War and the biological warfare you know, um, accusations. So I said, well, I just I just want to see the false confessions. I was interested. I wanted to see to read them and see what they read like. I, I at that time I believed that they were false. I believed what these people were telling me. I just wanted to see what it was like because I had a lot of torture vic victims, some of whom had been tortured by the government and in fact under torture, had given up information. All that thing about how torture doesn't produce information, it's a total lie. Yes, if you have somebody who doesn't know information, you torture them, they will give a false confession. But if you have someone who has information and you torture them, guess what? They very well might give up information. And they did it's over and over and over again. You, you read World War II histories, et cetera. Not always, but very often. Um, and sometimes it would be mixed up with other stuff and or the people would just become um, too debilitated to, to, to talk. But in general, uh, I did know from personal experience with some of my clients that people under torture can give up uh, information. So I wanted to see these false confessions. It was just anyway. And then I discovered I couldn't find them. They weren't published. I couldn't find one book in the United States. There. I couldn't find anything online. I had to go to the UK to find the book, to find copies of these confessions that I could read. This is how it was some years ago. Today, you can find them online, um, at least very poor copies of them. But but you can find them online. I think someone actually published them, uh, excuse me, Godfrey Roberts or David Pear, uh, these two guys, uh, 
or one of them published it on Kindle, I think, uh, as a Kindle book, ultimately. But so, uh, so I saw them and I, and I read them and I said, these aren't crazy false confessions. These are very sincere and detailed confessions of what happened during the uh, biological warfare attacks. And there's a reason even to this day, can't, there's really uh, uh, no discussion of that or almost no discussion of those confessions and what they say and the, the, the details about the germ warfare in Korea that come from these confessions. Um, but uh, now that's, that's how I got that They weren't it. easily available in the United States, even 50 well, years after the fact. Well, well, you want to blow your mind? <laughs> blow my mind? Is it blew my mind? Is it, well, yeah, why would that be? Well, it turned out and I just, one of my most recent stories at Substack goes into this about the biggest mass censorship program you never heard of, I think is the title of the article. That in 1950, consistent with the beginning of the Korean War, the United States uh, Postal Service and Customs Department and FBI instituted a program based on uh, um, an opinion by the Attorney General at the time of the FARA law, the, the uh, uh, Foreign Agents Registration Act, or whatever it's called, that. Um, yeah, that um, any third class material, any propaganda was coming from communist countries was uh, was anyone who sent it was by definition, therefore, a foreign agent. Even if you're a bookseller in Paris, you're now a foreign agent. Anything coming in would be destroyed. And they, they, they interdicted this material at the ports of entry and they destroyed them. And according to um, testimony at congressional hearings in the mid 50s, they were destroying hundreds of thousands of pieces of material, books, journals, recordings, um, manuals, anything coming from the Soviet Union, coming from China. Right American firewall. Korea. Yeah. Very, you know, and of course, your listeners have to remember, there was no internet in that day. There was no way that you could. And if you want to talk, you know, you'd have to get on an airplane and fly to Moscow, perhaps, if you wanted to read some, or maybe you could go to East Germany or whatever, but you couldn't get it in the United States. So these materials started disappearing. Uh, in the United States. And I found out that, that by accident as well. Um, a, a scholar, um, a, a mainstream um, academic scholar told me in an email one day, he was trying to get me to turn away from the biological warfare uh, info, info. But he was commiserating and saying, yeah, I used to be concerned with this. But he says, Jeff, you know, our own archives are very poor on this, as you well know, because, you know, so much material was destroyed. And I, he says, as you know, well, I don't know, what, what what is he talking about? So um, I wasn't in very good terms with him. I looked around myself and I was able to discover a law review article that looked at this program in the late 50s and um, discovered that um, some scientists were campaigning against this also during the 50s. And um, the Kennedy administration, in fact, had tried to end this program when they came into power in the early 60s. And hmm. um, the uh, Republican Congress or Republicans in Congress uh, stop that and did something that they had tried not to do for many years as they made it into a law. Well, once they made it into a law, see that whole program in which they were intercepting millions of pieces of mail and destroying them for 10 years of the fifties was, um, there was no, there was, was no, the, was uh, that the, was that what became official. the HP lingual program? Uh, eventually was, or, or no, no. that was, a, it's not related. That was, that was Angleton's thing. But I thought that was a little later. That was, yeah, that would had to do, I think with first class mail and interdicting but this is third class mail this is all books journals anything like that printed material yeah. coming in the united states so yeah so where's the book publishing or the or the or the uh chinese english language journal publishing the confessions it was seized at the border and burned and destroyed right. and, they, and so they yeah. never made it into u.s libraries um they never made it into archives so uh, I found mine at the Imperial War Museum, and I, I thank the people at the Imperial War Museum for making a copy for me and letting me have it, uh, because that was very helpful. But uh, in fact, it was interestingly enough, it was Joseph Needham's uh, own copy of the, um, of the um, Confessions. If people know who Joseph Needham is, he was the head of a, internet, of a commission that went to Korea and China during the Korean War and investigated the charges and found that the U.S. did he was a very famous British scientist and uh, science of, and also historian of science in England, you know, uh, given awards from the Queen and everything. This guy's a very legit guy. And uh, um, anyway, 
So yeah, it's, you know, the material is out there. You can look for it if you're motivated enough. It isn't always easy. And what, what does it mean that this much history has been hidden from us? I mean, tremendous. I mean, it would be, it's, it's similar to Holocaust denial in my mind. You know, uh, what does it mean if you have a society where atrocities at the level of the Holocaust or just, just about are, are hidden from their own society for decades, not just for a while, but for decades. Well, I think you, it's annual. Can, it's annual. We yeah. kill 9 million people a year just systemically by, uh, through different aspects of, of the capitalist system basically 9 million people Absolutely. die of malnutrition and starvation lack of access to clean water every year right. and it is that is the system that all of the chicanery that we're talking about all the covert operations and uh you know the state secrecy around different programs and other state crimes it's all to maintain a system that itself is a perpetual holocaust machine in terms of it's uh, the death that it causes around the world Absolutely. I mean, this is really heavy yeah. heavy stuff yes and right, I'm, I'm, we're glad that you have the we, we're glad that you have the motivation to dig through all this material and bring it to light because I mean it, you 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 mentioned like you're one of the only people doing this work. You said that you had an academic like you know mainstream guy say I eh, don't even bother with this stuff but, like get, yeah. get, get off this trail. And so it's well, worse than don't you know suppressed on that don't front. do it. Yeah. I'm sorry what yeah, this yeah. is. I mean, we we had the enlightenment in the in the so-called West, where we established that all people are created equal, and that we supposedly believe this, and that reason is the ultimate arbiter, uh, human logic and reason. That whether we have it from the Creator or from nature, that we, we need to rely on human reason. But it really has failed, and this we we see that secrecy and covert criminality is a big part of the history of the failure of the enlightenment. And we need some. We need a sequel. Uh, of sorts that I think that you could say that you're a part of, and I'd hope to be too, which is like uh, not just the enlightenment, mm -hmm. but like the great, the great illumination or something where many of these right. secrets of, of the, of the regime that we live under would, would come to light. And uh, so I, I hope we're trying to make that happen. And uh, Jeffrey K, I just want to thank you again for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Aaron. Thank you very much, Bryce. Absolutely. Thanks to Dana Trevaria for producing this episode, and thank you for tuning in. You can buy or rent the Four Die Trying Prologue now on Amazon and other streaming platforms. Chapter 1 is also available, especially at the Patreon site for Four Die Trying. Uh, visit fourdietrying.com for details about both of these. Please do subscribe to the American Exception podcast on Patreon for first access to all Devil's Chess Club episodes and for all new and past episodes of the American Exception podcast, including the Peter Dale Scott oral history series. Thanks to Jeffrey Kay for joining us again. This bio-warfare business is horrifying, along with the threat of nuclear war, I suppose. It is quite wild to think about the existential brinksmanship our rulers are willing to engage in just to remain in power. For those of us who are 